Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to see all of you this morning. I'm sure everybody's recovering from our loss of an hour. God bless that hour. Sure seemed useful <laughs> every year. Oh, the ironic thing is, is my children, who usually are up uh, before we want them to be, uh, this morning, my wife said, you have to go wake them up, otherwise the rest of the week will be off schedule and it'll be messed up. So I went to my one son, who's always the one who wakes us up in the morning, and said, uh, son, you have to get up now. And he said, why? <laughs> <laughs> he could not comprehend. Why would it be necessary for me to get up? I'm always the one uh, being told to go back to bed. This is a really unusual experience. <laughs> I'm sure that was our heart at some point last night or this morning as well. Why? Why? Why is this the case? But the good news is we have something that can wake our souls up this morning. It is the Word of God. It's good to remember when we turn to God's Word that it is His very voice speaking to us, re-speaking the truth of His Word. It is His Word of authority and of power and of joy and of hope it is the word that can transform our lives, that speaks into our, our affluence and our suffering to give us the kind of joy that every heart longs for that can only be found in him. That's what this word provides to us. So with that expectation, let's begin reading. We're going to continue in our series in the book of Philippians, Paul's letter to the Philippians beginning in chapter 1. And covering verses 15 through 18 this morning. Chapter 1, verses 15 through 18 in the book of Philippians. Let's read God's word to us. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of rivalry, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed. And in that, I rejoice. Lord, bless the preaching of your word. When I was 20 years old, 19 or 20 years old, I was asked to serve with a a worship band at a singles conference. And I was very excited. I was, I was nervous because this is going to be by far the largest group I'd ever served in a, a worship gathering kind of context. I was uh, by far the youngest uh, member of the band, a lot more experienced people I'd be playing with. I wasn't going to be like a, a key band member, but I was going to be playing. I was going to be on stage, and I was excited, nervous, looking forward to it. And yet as the conference unfolded, and we had session after session, and I was there with my friends, and, and we were enjoying the, the work of the Lord among us. I found myself actually miserable. I, I found myself somewhat distracted and not enjoying the context at all. And at some point, this became uh, so evident to me that I, I decided to find a quiet corner of this conference center where we were and to begin asking serious questions of my heart. And the most obvious one was, why aren't you enjoying this? What is wrong with you? Why, well, you seem to be moping around. You're constantly distracted. Why, why, why aren't you enjoying? Your friends are here. This is a time of enjoying God. What is the deal? And I sensed, as I'm sure you have at times, the Lord began to press something on my heart. You're focused entirely on yourself. You've been thinking about yourself. You've been thinking about how you measure up to the other band members, whether people are paying attention to you, whether you are as respected as they are musically. I remember having a thought later, I think it was that same conference, of comparing myself since all the other musicians seemed to be given solos and I didn't. 
And I began wondering what that meant about my musical stature and standing. And, and somehow, this is what was on my mind, session after session, moment after moment as the conference progressed. And it just seemed like the Lord was revealing that to me. You're focused completely on yourself. You're at a conference that's designed to focus you towards God. You're supposed to be serving, helping people focus on God. And yet in your mind, your attention is focused on your relative standing compared to the others, whether people are paying enough attention to you, whether you are better or worse than others. All of your attention is focused on yourself, and it's leading you to feel miserable. I've had that experience a lot of times in moments of ministry, in moments just of, of serving, where I find my mind captivated by myself, th thinking about myself, comparing myself to others, wondering how I stack up to them, noticing when others get encouragement and I don't, noticing when I don't get encouragement I think I deserve. I, I find myself often wondering what people are thinking about me. Well, thankfully, if you have ever had that experience, the scriptures have an answer for that experience. It, it, it has a, a solution. It has, we might even call it a deliverance from that miserable process of thinking about yourself all the time. And Paul describes a, a personal experience he's having while imprisoned in Rome that can deliver us from focusing on ourselves. He presents himself, as he often does, as an example to us. And he points out this same self-focus that is present in other proclaimers of Christ in that same city. And it, it, the design of the passage is to bring to us a, a life-changing, a, a misery-reversing truth. Our joy must be found not in ourselves, but in Christ Jesus. Our joy must be found not in ourselves, but in the proclamation of Christ. As long as we are concerned with the proclamation of our own name, the exaltation of our own reputation, we position ourselves, chain ourselves to the miserable process of thinking of yourself continually. But if you are set free from that slavery and focused on the Lord Jesus Christ, you can rejoice regardless of whether you are being compared from one to another. This is, this is good news this morning. This is good news because all of us have a tendency to focus on ourselves in comparison to others. And Paul is giving us the opportunity to free ourselves from that misery. Let's begin reading. The passage breaks down into two sections. Paul first describes two motivations that are, just, that are taking place among these newfound, uh, courageous preachers that are around him in Rome. Two motivations that are present in this uh, new expansion of evangelism. And then he brings one joyful conclusion. So two motivations and then one conclusion. Just two, two points this morning. Let's, let's begin walking through what's happening. If you remember last week, we studied how Paul makes the startling claim that his imprisonment actually has served to advance the gospel. And one of the ways it has done that is by emboldening the fellow believers in Rome to preach with greater courage. Apparently, the brothers, the Christians, brothers and sisters who are there, have found a courage because of Paul's imprisonment. They've seen Paul in prison that has caused them to increase their confidence in the Lord, in the unstoppable gospel, and to begin proclaiming, the previous verse says, the word without fear, with boldness. And yet, Paul notices that in this group that is now proclaiming Christ boldly, there are two different additional motivations. And so he begins to describe those motivations. So we, we want to bear in mind, these are brothers these are brothers and sisters. These are proclaimers of Christ. So these are not heretics. They are not even, you might say, enemies of the gospel or of the church. These are all this same group. And not only that, they are all a part of this group that is speaking boldly with greater confidence in the Lord. And yet, Paul says, for some of them, there is an ungodly motive 
in addition to their confidence in the Lord, in addition and behind their proclamation of Christ. They are proclaiming Christ, but their motives are not pure. So he describes two different groups. You notice this, this passage is almost poetic. He, he almost has a, a rhythm. Some preach Christ from envy, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love. The former proclaim Christ out of rivalry. So he begins and ends this description with this second group that is full of rivalry and ambition. And then he describes there are some that preach from goodwill. Let's look at that first group first. Others, he says, from goodwill. Look at this, this inner group that we'll focus on first. The, the, there are some who are preaching out of goodwill to Paul. They have goodwill. And then he describes them further down that they do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. So these are these bold new preachers of Christ who are motivated, Paul says, out of goodwill towards Paul and love for him because they are aware that his imprisonment for Christ is a divine appointment and they view that as a, an impetus for their own courageous preaching. These are Christians who love Paul. They have a, a measure of a desire to serve and benefit him and seeing him in change causes them to say, I, I should take up his place. Paul can't go to the marketplace the way he used to and talk about Jesus. So out of love for Paul and a desire to identify with him, I will take his place. Now, there's something thrilling about this, this group. It's, it's not the group that's accented in this passage, but it should be very encouraging that a love for those who suffer in Christ should produce a desire to identify with them in the gospel. This is this, this godly group, this group that is proclaiming Christ out of right motives. They have goodwill towards Paul. They have love for him. They have a confidence that his imprisonment is not due to divine disfavor, but because of his stance for the gospel. They are presented in a, a positive kind of way. Paul always commends brothers and sisters who are willing to stand with those who are suffering for the gospel. Paul, Paul has none of a kind of PR distancing of yourself from those who are suffering for Christ. He has none of that. He doesn't count that as being a, a worthy, worldly wise kind of wisdom. He commends those who, because of their love for Paul and their appreciation that he's doing this for the gospel, they, they want to identify with him and Christ by proclaiming Christ in a bolder way because of Paul's suffering. Now, this is motivating for us. This good motivation should motivate us. If we have joy in Christ and love for the proclaimers of Christ, we should count suffering for Christ as a motive to proclaim Christ with greater boldness out of love for those who are also suffering for him. This should motivate us. We should want to be in this group. In other words, we shouldn't be thinking primarily when some Christian is suffering for Christ, I'm, I'm glad that isn't me. And I, I don't want to be too associated with that individual because... They're, they're, for some reason, getting the attention, the animosity of the culture right now. I'm glad that isn't me. No, there should be such a love for that individual and goodwill towards them if they are suffering for Christ that we should want to identify publicly with the Christ that they are suffering for. It should compel us forward. Why? Because our joy is in Christ and not in preserving our maybe current bubble of, of, of cultural immunization. No, that's not our goal. Our goal is to identify with those who are suffering, like this goodwill loving group. Paul is grateful for this group. He commends them. They are preaching Christ out of goodwill, out of love. They are, they are seeing the need that suffering has caused, and they want to step into that gap with action. Paul always commends those who are willing to put their love of the Lord and their love for his servants into action. Paul has none of a kind of hypothetical love for the persecuted church that doesn't display itself in actual action in service of the gospel. If, if you talk to Paul about how you're, you're united and you're, you have well wishes towards those who are suffering, Paul would say, well, what are you doing about it? What are you doing about it? Those who have goodwill towards those suffering for the gospel should display that by a greater activity on behalf of the gospel. 
revealing that their joy is in Christ and not in their comfort. This is this goodwill group that Paul commends. But the accent here in this description, since he begins and ends this description with this negative group, is on these people who are preaching Christ and are even preaching Christ with a new boldness, and even if we take the description earlier, have a greater confidence in the Lord, and yet Paul discerns in their motives a selfishness, a craving, a rivalry. And so he says, some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry. And then as he describes them later, the former proclaim Christ out of rivalry, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. Now, this is a remarkable. If you put all these phrases together, this is part of the most of the brothers. Verse 14, most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. This is that most of the brothers. So some are not preaching Christ at all. Some perhaps have been afraid and are not willing to be involved in any sense because they're afraid of persecution, perhaps. Or maybe they're just disinterested or maybe they're lazy. But Paul's now describing the some that are preaching Christ. Of that group, some preach Christ from envy and rivalry, thinking to afflict Paul in his imprisonment. Here's a, a remarkable observation Paul is making. It is possible to preach the accurate gospel... And even at some level to preach it boldly and out of some confidence in the Lord and yet have in the heart a selfish motive. It is possible to, yes, be serving the accurate gospel, preaching it accurately out of some confidence in the Lord, even with boldness. And yet have in your heart a craving to view that ministry as a way to promote yourself. And actually, I think this is far more common than we'd we'd want to admit. That's what I was doing at that conference. Was my heart completely sinful that I have no desire to serve the Lord? Of course not. I I wanted to serve the Lord. I was was worshiping Him. Yes, at some level, I was confident in the Lord. Yes, I was. I was was preaching in that sense accurately. Yes, I was. But in my heart, there was also a focus on myself. And that's entirely possible for all kinds of ministry to the Lord. To serve the Lord, yes. To be accurate in the gospel, yes. But also to be serving oneself. This seems to be true of this group. Let's look at some of these words. They do it, Paul says, they preach Christ from envy and rivalry. Notice the word is repeated, rivalry. There's this desire to... See Paul as a competitor. Somehow in the hearts of some of these brothers in in Rome, they had viewed Paul apparently as competition. They they viewed Paul's perhaps his popularity, perhaps his stature, perhaps the the crowd sizes that came to hear him speak. They they viewed those with envy. They, They didn't want Paul to get the kind of attention and focus that he received. You can speculate as to why. Uh, Perhaps it was they felt like they could preach the gospel in a better kind of way. Perhaps they had some theological accents that they didn't think he was doing enough of. They had a a better way to do it. When I was a kid, one of my my siblings, one of his like major uh, training aspects that my my dad had to bring to him was, was, was pointing out to him that he always had a better way. He always had a better way. So he would always be recommending a better way to do it to the rest of the family. And so my my parents had to point out to him, son, you always seem to have a better way. You always know better than everybody else. You're always inserting yourself to point out that you know better how it should go, that you know better what it should be, that you know better how to think about it. So he just began to use that as a phrase, son, you don't have a better way. That seems to be what's happening in Rome. We, We want some of Paul's reputation. We think we can do better, perhaps, or we, we think we certainly deserve more attention. And, and this has so gripped their perspective that they actually assume that Paul thinks the same way. When, when envy and rivalry and selfish ambition so grips your heart, you know what begins to happen? You just begin to assume everybody thinks that way. 
I think this is what, if you look at your Bibles, I think this is what they're saying when they, they say they want to afflict Paul in his imprisonment. I think that what they think is that Paul is likewise consumed with himself. And so if they can take some of his crowds and reputation while he's conveniently in jail, well, he's really going to be disappointed because he can't do anything about it. They assume that Paul will be really disappointed to find that somebody else is getting attention and not him. What's that reveal about them? Their heart is so focused on themselves and on selfish ambition and on envy and on being better and a, a more attention given to them than Paul, that they just assume everybody thinks that way. Surely Paul cares about his own name in the preaching of the gospel. Surely Paul will be really disappointed. It's almost like you can imagine these, these sinful motivations rolling through their mind. Oh, I bet it's just burning Paul up. I bet it is just driving him crazy. That I was at the marketplace. That I got his speaking slot. That some of those people that were listening to him are now listening to me. That my group size is now much bigger than his because all he can talk to is those praetorian guards in his jail cell or in his house arrest. Man, I, I love it. My, my stature is on the rise. My, my worth is increasing. My, my ministry is expanding. And I just got to be driving Paul crazy because you know what he cares about is himself. Selfish ambition produces a cynicism about everyone else in addition to blinding your own heart to what is really valuable. Selfish ambition causes you to assume that other people care about themselves in the same way that we do. That's what's happening with this group. They are envious of Paul's stature. They see him as a rival. They want to promote themselves, and they see Paul's imprisonment. Shockingly, so great has this sin uh, penetrated and, and gripped their heart that even Paul's imprisonment doesn't shake them out of their self-focus. Have you ever had a moment, because I have, where... A potential rival experiences a, a circumstantial setback, and some corner of your heart sees this as an opportunity. If you're really honest with yourself, I, I, I've had that moment. And I'm, I'm quickly ashamed of it, thankfully, at least the times I'm aware of it, I'm ashamed. Oh, what? no, I, I don't want that. I don't want that to happen. I don't want them to have some kind of temporary inconvenience. Certainly not suffering. No, I, I, I don't want that. But there is something in my heart that thinks, oh, here's the opportunity for me to finally be able to do what I should be able to do. They're, they're not going to be able to get all that same attention now. This group has gone so far in the direction of rivalry and self-promotion that even Paul's imprisonment is a cause for some internal joy. They find joy so much in their own promotion that Paul being in prison is an opportunity rather than a tragedy. Paul viewing in prison is a chance. It's a lane. It's an opening. If you, if you could use, and I don't know anything about race car driving, okay, other than watching cars with my children, all right? That's the only thing I know. But, but if you could use a car's analogy, this is like a driver who just really wants first place, and when he sees that other driver pull off with a mechanical problem, they rejoice, except that driver is on your team, and you're both trying to pull the gospel forward. They're rejoicing in Paul's chains because it's a chance for them to promote themselves. It's ugly, isn't it? It's ugly. It's a sinful motive. It's a deplorable kind of rejoicing. Christ is merely a platform for their own promotion. Christ is merely a ladder that they can use to raise their head towards greater stature and, and reputation and popularity. Christ is merely the means for their own exaltation. Look, we need to feel the penetrating discernment, the almost shocking confrontation that Paul provides here. Now, he's going to go on to say that for him... Even this shocking motive is not an interrupter of his joy. 
But in order to enjoy Paul's conclusion, we have to feel the ugliness, the sinfulness that he is pointing out here about these brothers. Paul is not saying that motives are irrelevant compared to the final product. This is not the end justifies the means. Because Paul points out the sinfulness of their motives. Their motives are sinful. Now, Paul will go on to say that for him, his own experience of people's rivalry towards him is irrelevant compared to the proclamation of Christ. But he's not exonerating their motives. He's merely saying that for him, he doesn't care about suffering from the rivalry of others as long as God somehow presses the gospel forward. But he is simultaneously saying, God is very aware of what is motivating the ministry of these other preachers. God knows that though they are preaching Christ accurately and perhaps even boldly, in their heart is a craving for themselves. Brothers and sisters, we have to be convicted about any evidence of this same motive in our own heart. We should not desire that this be our final reputation. That though we preached Christ accurately, we did so out of a motive to exalt ourselves. Though we served Christ accurately, we did so out of a desire to exalt ourselves. Though we loved the ministry of Christ, we loved it because it gave us a name compared to others. Paul is not exonerating them. He's revealing and exposing their motives. And since this is God's word, we also know that God himself knows their motives. Let, let's, let's consider for a moment, is there any person that you serve with in your family, in the church, in, in the broader body of Christ, that, that you view them as a rival, and you are perhaps at times disappointed when they get attention that you wanted to have? Let me give you some practical examples that I can think of in my own life. How do you do when someone other than you gets encouraged for the same kind of ministry that you do. Have you ever had that experience? You're in a group setting and you're talking with friends and they are with someone who serves with you on the same ministry team, for example, or maybe in the same outreach moment, and, and, and that person receives some encouragement. Hey, thank you for serving. I really appreciated your work the other day. I thank you for, for laying your life down. And you're sitting there just waiting, waiting for finally the attention to turn to you. And then it never does. What happens in your heart right then? Well, for these people, what happened was a growing bitterness and a growing frustration. And when Paul was, so to speak, removed off the board, they rejoiced because they saw it as a chance to finally get the attention they've been wanting. How do you deal when other people receive encouragement that you think you deserve? How do you do in the quiet of your heart when you go away from a a conversation in which someone else seem to be appreciated for what they shared and you didn't. Have you ever had that moment like in a small group meeting? We have community groups where we're talking together and, and you share something and everybody nods and then somebody else shares something and everybody oohs and ahs and claps and starts worshiping the Lord. Have you ever had that moment where you, you think, wait a minute, like I, I said that earlier almost the same way, but they say it, and everybody's thrilled and writing notes and saying we should have a, a revival meeting after they, they shared the same thing I shared. Have you ever had that moment? Or maybe with a spouse, you've been saying something for, I don't know, like 12 years, and then they go to the men's meeting, and Joe says it, and all of a sudden they come back ready to change. Have you ever had that experience? And you're envious, why, why don't I get the credit for that? There's a great book about Christian ministry written by a long couple hundred years ago called Charles Bridges. And I, I think this is from him. I'm not sure this is the quote from him, but, but he, there's some point where he's talking about pride in ministry. He calls it one of the great downfalls of ministry that we, we crave the attention of others. He says, sometimes, sometimes I, I feel attention from others and I am glad, but I deplore the gladness that I feel. 
do you deplore the gladness that you feel when, when the attention is given to you in ministry? That, that gladness that's not focused on the glory that goes to the Lord, but that is, is personally gratified that someone has finally noticed. That's what Paul is pointing out in these, these Roman brothers. They are, they are glad to receive attention. Brothers and sisters, the sin of comparison is exposed in the sight of God. Sin of envy and rivalry. How do, how do you do when someone more gifted than you comes to your ministry team? Are you the one recommending that they take your place? Or does it take a lot of meetings and, and difficult, awkward conversations for someone to point out that, that here's someone that, that might be able to do this? Perhaps they have a greater gifting than you in this area. Or are you the one that says, have, have you met Cindy? She's fantastic. She should do this. Let, let me step down. I can serve somewhere else. She should do this. What are these moments? But they're, they're little test cases for where our joy is actually found. For these rivals, their joy was found not outside the ministry of Christ, but in the ministry of Christ except for themselves. It's not like these people are promoting pagan worship or idolatry. They're promoting Christ as long as they get some attention. This is what Paul is exposing. This is what he is experiencing. There are fellow Christians who are effectively rejoicing in his suffering because it creates an opportunity for themselves. Imagine how difficult this was for Paul. Imagine how hard. This is the man who has given his life. He has labored. He has stood for Christ. He has declared to this very city of Rome how much he desires to benefit them and to receive from them. If you read that in the beginning of Romans, he wants to impart gifts to them. He wants to receive from them. He wants to partner with them in ministry. He is full of affection for the way God has used them in the past, will use them in the future. And then he finds out that some of them are secretly excited he's in prison because it gives them a chance to increase their own reputation. Brothers and sisters, this must not be present in the church. It must not be present in our hearts. It must not be present because it reveals that our joy is found in ourselves. And it would be perhaps remiss for me to not point out that it is possible, according to Jesus, for Every manner of impressive ministry to be accomplished for Christ, even by those who don't actually know him as Savior and Lord. Now, in this case, these seem to be genuine Christians who simply have a sinful motive present. But it's also possible for someone to serve in all kinds of external ways and not know that in their heart they haven't even given their life to the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. That's the point of, of Jesus' word in Matthew when he points out that there will be some on the last day who will say, Lord, Lord, didn't we do all kinds of work and ministry in your name? Didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we serve in your name? Didn't in your name we do mighty works? He'll say, I never knew you. Depart from me. This is an extreme version of Philippians 1, 15 through 18. In this case, it seems to be genuine Christians, but it's also possible that among genuine Christians, there are those who are boldly and courageously even, and even dramatically serving the Lord, but whose hearts are consumed with themselves. Perhaps ministry has become a means of false assurance that they are good with the Lord. Listen, ministry itself on the outside cannot be a means of assurance that our hearts are right with the Lord. It's possible even for non-Christians to serve Christ in the outside of their lives. And certainly for Christians, we must be willing to acknowledge, just because I'm serving Christ on the outside doesn't mean that in this moment or in this conversation or in this ministry, I am serving Christ and not myself. Imagine how difficult this was for Paul to realize this was the case, and yet... How good it is to hear Paul's conclusion. Because the focus of this passage is not even primarily the motives of these people, but Paul's response to his own suffering because of those motives. So he moves from the description of these two motivations to this one joyful conclusion. 
one joyful conclusion. He says, what then, in verse 18, what then, only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. This is Paul's conclusion. Now, very important to to reiterate the caveat here. He is not saying their motives don't matter. He's saying that their sin against him and whatever suffering and indignity he might have felt is irrelevant to him in comparison to the fact that Christ is being proclaimed. He's not saying they won't be finally disciplined or evaluated by the Lord for their sin. He's saying that for him, for him, as it relates to his experience, he is able to rejoice that these sinful brothers are actually proclaiming Christ accurately. For him, what matters is not the unfairness of the situation to him, but the joy he has that even those who are sinfully proclaiming Christ are at least proclaiming Christ. For Paul, the unfairness of their motives is irrelevant compared to the accuracy of their proclamation. For Paul, the injustice of their rivalry is irrelevant compared to the fact that God is using even sinful Christians to accomplish the advance of his gospel. He's not commending sinful motives. He's celebrating that God in his wisdom is able to even use those motivated sinfully to accomplish a good result. Incredible. Incredible. Think of Paul just as an individual here. He's saying, what then? In, in modern parlance, we might say, so what? Paul says. The the assumption is, Paul, you must really be grieved by this. Those brothers are hoping that you're going to be afflicted. You're going to be disappointed. Perhaps you're going to be crushed. Your self-esteem is going to be uh, taking a crash here. Paul says, no, not at all. Because for Paul, his joy is not found in himself, but in the proclamation of Christ. So that even rivalry and selfish ambition, even inside the church where it should not be, even that can't take away his joy. Even his, his sadness over their motives can't take away his joy because he sees God using even sinful Christians to accomplish his divine purpose. They can't take away his joy because his joy isn't found in his reputation. Unlike them, Paul actually doesn't care about his standing, stature, or reputation. Unlike them, Paul really is free from the misery of focusing on himself. Unlike them, Paul could care less who gets the crowd and who gets the fame as long as Christ is proclaimed. You notice the freedom that Paul is offering to the Philippian church here by way of his example? You notice that? He's offering them a freedom that is out of reach of their experience of the rivalry of others. Do you see that, what he's offering to them? He's saying, look, you don't have to be crushed when injustice takes place and others seek to promote themselves at your expense. You you don't have to be crushed. Paul's able to say, so what? As far as he is concerned, so what if Jim gets the ministry spot and you don't, even though you know Jim's doing it with a smirk because he likes getting the better of you? So what, Paul says. So what if, if you don't get the attention and that other person does in the conversation, even though you know that they wink on you in the way out because they like that they got the attention and you didn't? Paul says, so what? Paul says, so what, even though these brothers are callous about his suffering for Christ? Paul says, so what? What then? You might hear him saying, what do I care? You, you notice the freedom here he's presenting to the Philippians? What do I care? Paul these guys, what, is there a strong enough word to describe a Christian who is gloating over Paul's chains? Come on, Paul, give, give me a little something. Give me something. I mean, that has got to burn you up a little bit. You're in chains and they're gloating? Come on, Paul. He says, so what? I don't care. I care about their motives before God that is deeply grieving. But in terms of me, so What? So what if my my children notice things in my spouse and they are grateful for her or for 
but not for me. So, so what if this, this fellow minister gets all the attention and I don't? So, so what if, if they get promoted and I don't? So what if they get the position and I don't? So what if, if they get to be used and, and for some reason God blesses their ministry in a profound way, even though I'm aware that they haven't been as godly as I have been in a particular situation? Paul says, so what? As it relates to me, so what, Paul says? What then? Only that in every way, Whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed. Paul can stare at his functional enemy in his mind's eye, preaching in his pulpit, in that gathering, knowing that that individual is rejoicing that it's not Paul and it's him. He can be aware of the sinfulness of that motive. He can be aware that internally this man is is mixed and needs reformation of soul. And yet when that person proclaims Christ crucified, Paul is rejoicing that people are hearing that message. Why? Because for Paul, his joy is not in himself, but in the proclamation of Christ Jesus. His joy is not in himself, but in the proclamation of Christ Jesus. For Paul, as he'll say it a few more verses, Christ is life. For me to live is Christ. For me to live is not Paul, is not Paul's reputation, is not Paul's fame. To live is Christ. And even the sinful motives of other Christians, as they relate to me, are irrelevant in comparison to the proclamation of Christ Jesus. Listen, brothers and sisters, this is a joy that can be given to us if we will cast aside our own reputation, our own rights, our own sense of justice, our own sense of of, of what we deserve. I can cling only to the proclamation of Christ Jesus. It doesn't mean Paul wouldn't confront these brothers and sisters if he has the chance out of love for them, but he is not looking for a way to elbow his way back in and get his own. What a freedom Paul presents in in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, by rivals, by the selfishly ambitious, by those envious, by those with mixed motives, by those who are looking to cause me greater suffering. Paul rejoices that God is still using them. What a word for, for us as Christians. We, we look maybe a, a, across the city or across the country at, at churches that perhaps use church as a platform for their own name, and yet in certain cases they are accurately preaching the gospel. Not always, but some are accurately preaching the gospel. And, and does our heart rejoice or does it grumble? That Why has God given a greater public stature to that person or that ministry? No, Paul says, so What? I'm rejoicing, not in their motives, but I'm rejoicing that Christ is proclaimed. And and notice also his concluding phrase, in that I rejoice. It's not just that he's content. Paul takes it to another level. He rejoices in the fact that even these sinful Christians, in the wisdom and, and superior providence of God, are still getting something done for the gospel. Paul is so free from a focus on himself that not only is he content and enduring this difficult moment, he's rejoicing in it. He's rejoicing that these selfish, envious Christians are being used by God. It's a cause for worship from Paul's heart. Paul is worshiping Christ that Christ is using even sinful Christians whose sin is against Paul. They are rejoicing in his suffering. Paul is rejoicing in their usefulness. You, You can feel the effect of Paul's later words when he says, whatever you have seen and heard in me, practice these things. He's going to directly command them in chapter 2 to fulfill this same example. Do nothing from envy or rivalry. And why is he able to do this? What is Paul's motivation? He makes it very clear at the beginning of the letter, and as he moves into chapter 2, he makes it very clear. For Christ to be life means that Paul has consumed himself 
with one who laid aside his rights in order to serve those who hated God. The the cross has so shaped Paul's identity that he is likewise crucified to himself in order to serve the Lord. Why is Paul's joy possible in a moment like this? Well, because he serves the crucified Savior. He serves the one who laid aside his rights in order to lift up his enemies. He served the one who didn't count equality with God a thing to be grasped. So for Paul, the logic is as follows. If Jesus doesn't grasp equality with God, who am I to grasp my rightful reputation as a preacher? If Jesus laid aside his own rightful equality with God himself, who am I to hang on to my rights and my justice in the face of these rivalrous sinners? No, I I am gladly willing to exalt that one who gave himself up for me. I am gladly willing to focus, focus all my joy on that one who crucified himself for my sake, who laid his own life down for me. I am gladly willing to see that if his name is exalted, I could care less what happens to me. Paul is saying in his own humble, worshipful way, not my will, but yours be done. This is cross-centered joy. Cross-centered joy sees the reputation and exaltation of others as irrelevant as long as the glory of God and the gospel of Christ is proclaimed. This is cross-centered joy. It's the joy that Jesus had before him such that he endured the cross, scorning its shame because his joy was outside the reach of his enemies. His joy was outside the reach of rivalries. His joy was outside the reach of fairness. His joy was outside the reach of being perceived in a certain way. His joy was outside the reach of being noticed or known. His joy was outside the reach of having a a better reputation than someone else. His joy was outside the reach of comparing himself with others or receiving their recognition for all that he had done. His joy was outside the reach of how he was viewed by others or how they viewed him. His joy was found in the crucified Messiah. And in that Messiah, Paul had all the joy he needed. Brothers and sisters, how many moments in a given week do you have to find joy in that same crucified and risen Christ? And how many moments do we have in a week where we must cast aside ourselves, our reputation, our interests, and be joyfully exulting in the proclamation of Christ? This is good news for us. It, it, it can set us free from the misery that comes from focusing on ourselves. For a long time, I had a a quote on my computer screen that just, I was trying to remember this because I thought it applies to so many moments. The more a man thinks of Christ, the less he will think of himself. I I think it's true qualitatively. The the greater he thinks Christ is, the lesser he will think he is. It's also quantitatively, the more he actually thinks about Christ, the less he will actually think about himself. There's only one replacement that I know of for the perpetual spiral of self-evaluation and the fear of man. It's the active focusing on Christ Jesus and his glory. There's only one deliverance from the chains of comparison. It's exulting in Christ Jesus, the crucified and risen one. There's only one joy that can set us free from thinking about ourselves through the eyes of others after every conversation and ministry moment. It's dwelling on the Son of God who laid himself down for us and casting a reputation at his feet and exulting only in his name and not in our own. This is the joy that Paul holds out to us to be set free from the comparison and rivalry that threatens to take that joy away from us. John Newton is credited with having said the following. It's always motivated me because I I think when we get to heaven, 
we will experience this joy permanently. We'll be set free from all the selfish cravings that drive us in all these little moments. He said, if two angels were to receive at the same moment a commission from God, one to go down and rule earth's grandest empire, the other to go and sweep the streets of its meanest village, it would be a matter of entire indifference to each which service fell to his lot. I think that's true of this man as well. He's indifferent. Whether he's in prison or preaching to a large crowd, whether he's known or not known, whether he's recognized or not recognized, whether he's treated fairly by others or not treated fairly, it's complete indifference to him in comparison to the one who has commissioned him. And because of that same one, we, you, in your marriage, in your parenting, in your ministry, in this church, outside in the world, you can also be set free from the chains of self-focus to enjoy the unstoppable advance of the name of Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we are so grateful to you for offering us this joy. Lord, I pray for different roles that we have right now. Lord, I pray for marriages, husbands and wives, that, Lord, they would be set free from a focus on their own rights and reputation and set free to enjoy, Lord, your name and your proclamation above all things. Lord, I pray for fellow servants in ministry. Lord, that we would be those enjoying, truly rejoicing in your use of others, even when they are imperfect, even when they have sinned against us. Lord, I pray that you would protect us from the rivalry that was present in some of these brothers. Lord, let us not use your name as a ladder for our own greatness. Lord, cause us to be like Paul and to rejoice regardless of our reputation, our current condition to rejoice in you in the proclamation of your name, the advance of your gospel. Let that consume us. Lord, let that be true of this church. Please, Lord, for the decades, Lord, centuries, I pray, until you return, Lord, may the membership of this church be in a race to humility because there and there alone is the unstealable joy. Let us enjoy you and not ourselves. We thank you and we rejoice in you. In Jesus' name.